Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. We will continue with Hebrews chapter 10. Let's, uh, oh, okay, Hebrews chapter 9. <laughs> Sorry, I was ahead of myself. So, uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Let's begin by reading the first five verses uh, and then we will, you know, follow through with the rest. So, any volunteers? Yeah. Yes, Christopher. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordin ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was a lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Yes, thank you, Christopher. Uh, so as the author continues to make several points about Jesus being greater uh, and his covenant being better, he is now presenting a picture of the tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle and the parts of the tabernacle, not just the parts, uh, but also some of the, the uh, contents or the furniture of the tabernacle so he says that uh, under the first covenant there were certain regulations or he says ordinances of divine service there were certain regulations for divine worship certain practices that were uh, done in the earthly tabernacle or the sanctuary and then he describes the parts okay so we are quite aware of uh, the parts so obviously outside was the outer court and then when, when you come into the inner court now he is describing um, in the holy place the things like uh, lampstand table showbread okay so these all again have their own significance uh, his his intent is not to describe all over again what these things stand for but he'll continue to make a point and we we are all aware you know we are aware of the holy place uh, and the significance of these items uh, and the fact that the presence of god dwelt in the holy of holies which carried the ark of the covenant okay the ark of the covenant um, very important very important uh, portion of the tabernacle so let's see where he is headed to now let's uh, read on verse 6 through 10. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services, but into the second part of the high priest went alone once a year not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are not offered which cannot make him to perform the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, the fleshly ordinance imposed until the time of reformation. Yes, so uh, he is now trying to point towards a fulfillment that has taken place so you know he uses uh, things uh, words like until the time of the reformation 
okay uh, and uh, in verse 8 he says the holy spirit indicating this that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing so he's saying that these practices continued but there was supposed to be a time when something better would come in position and at that time these practices would no longer be required okay because these practices were but you know a shadow uh, these practices were just uh, indicating to the fulfillment uh, which will come in a in a in a better manner through jesus christ so that's what he's saying so he described the portions of the tabernacle and now let's see uh, what other things he has listed out here so in verse 6 he said that uh, you know the hebrew believers were aware uh, that uh, things haven't prepared the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services so you know we know that there were so many responsibilities for the priests where uh, they had to uh, uh, you know they had to attend the lamps on the lampstand they had to offer daily sacrifices now uh, they also needed to burn incense in the holy place uh, now the incense the uh, fire right uh, the lampstand all those things should not it should not go off so you can imagine there was work 24 bar 7 right they needed to keep all this up so that was a lot of hard work and when people came in making sacrifices and uh, you know taking their gifts they had to uh, involve in, in all these uh, regulations of divine worship weekly they had to make sure that the bread on the table was renewed uh, and uh, they also used to eat the old loaves right so that they, they were given all, all these laws so they kept it and we would notice that uh when it came to sacrifices there were other duties which they needed to perform so uh, while sacrificing they would have to collect the blood of the uh, animal you know that is being sacrificed they had to offer a portion of that on the altar they had to you know have a portion of it which was assigned to them so there's so much of work okay uh, a lot of work which is being done but here's the point he's saying yes all these duties seem so noble uh, in the service of god in the service of people but at the same time uh, there's something far better that has been accomplished through jesus okay uh, which which again we we are not saying that these things were not useful or effective in the time when they were asked to be done they served a purpose but there's something greater that has now come into being so you know these priests their their works were uh, uh, quite a bit so they had to make all these regular sacrifices and if you go into studying about all the sacrifices they made there's an entire list uh, burnt uh, offerings they had to present grain offerings peace fellowship offering sin offering guilt offering so you know they had to do all that uh, sacrifices they had to do morning and evening sacrifices uh, part of passover and on the day of uh, atonement or uh, yom kippur kippur as uh, it is called in in the hebrew language they had to ensure that you know they fulfilled all these things uh, but then something has been done in such a manner that these practices you know no longer have to be performed okay so in verse 7 he says okay uh, into the second part the high priest went alone once a year so that is the yom, yom uh, kippur day of atonement that we talk about where once in a year the high priest he had to ceremonially cleanse himself and he had to enter the holy of holies and it was a very uh, you know the act of uh, 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 reverence you know on the part of the the priest uh, god's presence right they they all feared the presence of god in that holy of holies and so the high priest would really have to be uh, uh, you know uh, 
he he had to cleanse himself in such a way that no sin may be found in him and that he would survive going into the holy of holies so this was the manner in which these uh, priests and high priests were serving and when this high priest went into the holy of holies he would take the blood of sacrifice and sprinkle it on the mercy seat to make atonement for the sins of the congregation so this is the way the service was going on in the tabernacle uh, in verse 8 he says the holy spirit indicating this that the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing so when these practices were going on as uh, asha pointed out earlier she said that uh, we now can talk to god we can approach him easily uh, and we've also seen you know passages earlier which said that we can go boldly into the presence of god now if you look at these temple practices there was the priest who had access till the holy place and there was the high priest who had access into the holy of holies but not a regular uh, israelite so the kind of communion that man wanted with god you know that though these practices were we'll see later the word in verse 9 he's using symbolic it was symbolic or symbolic is simply to say uh, it's it's like a comparison it's like a figure of of something which is to come so all these were symbolic in telling people that God wants communion. And for that communion, one needs to be sinless. And for being sinless, a sacrifice needs to be made for uh, you know, the, the covering of their sin. Uh, and uh, that's when you know, we uh, can have that restored relationship with God. So many things were indicative of what God wanted and how he wanted it done. So no wonder earlier in Hebrews 8, we said the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, the place of worship, where we want to enter into the presence of God. But here is the earthly tabernacle, which is symbolic, comparative, and it's showing the people that this is a very holy place, the presence of God, and we can't just enter it however we like. There is a way in which one must enter and all these sacrifices have to be made and so uh, he's telling the hebrew believers that look god was just trying to tell us the requirements but until the time you know until the time remember he he kept mentioning the earthly tabernacle was meant to stand or it was effective uh, till the actual sacrifice and the actual high priest came into the picture and you know uh, the actual way was made into the presence of god once that was done there was fulfillment of what had been spoken of earlier the old covenant the old uh, worship practices so uh, in verses 9 and 10 that's what he's saying these practices were actually a shadow of what Christ was to bring. What was Christ supposed to bring? A better covenant. Uh, and uh, even, uh, you know, the uh, best uh, gifts and the best sacrifices that were used in the earthly tabernacle, they were incapable of perfecting okay, the conscience and renewing the inner person uh, of the worshiper. And so, you know, these practices continued. How long? they just continued day after day day after day imagine if uh, the sacrifices were good enough to cleanse them completely why would they be need to why would there be a need to repeat it the next day but for years on end they are doing these things because it was not capable to perfect the worshiper but here we have remember we asked what is so good about the new covenant okay what is so good about the better promises here it is the worshiper is cleansed right uh, perfection can come in 
through the work that Jesus has done on the cross for us. So daily going in and following up, you know, with all these ordinances and uh, regulations of uh, worship. In fact, another term that can be used here is fleshly ordinances. Because in verse 10, he says they are concerned with what? Food, drinks, washing. And then he adds on fleshly ordinances. There's no requirement for these things. Uh, let's move on. Verses 11 and 12, please. If someone can read it. In 11 and 12, it reads, So Christ has come, become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands, and is not part of this created world. With his blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured redemption forever. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Say. Uh, uh, just before we go into the next two verses, there is a uh, there is a question, I think. Kennedy, he says, what was the Holy Spirit indicating by not allowing anyone except the high priest to enter? the most holy place and that on one day in a year during Yom Kippur. So, uh, yeah, Kennedy, uh, the Holy Spirit was just indicating that there is a method or a right way of entering into the presence of God. Not anyone could enter it. Okay. You had, you had to be made eligible. And that is why you had the high priest. First of all, they had to come from a certain line and then, you know, they would go through the whole cleansing rituals. Uh, that's when the priest could enter. And then, of course, the high priest to enter the holiest, uh, holy of holies, they also you know, required that cleansing and they were only allowed to go in once in a year. So all this is just telling us that our God is so holy. Yes, we want to have communion with him, but we must rem remember that he is not like us. And to approach, you know, uh, there are other passages that tell us he, he dwells in unapproachable light. So in order for us to approach this holy God, we have to also put on that holiness. And, uh, you know, thank God for Jesus. Because of him, we have now been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So, uh, yes, man wants to approach God. But what the tabernacle was telling us is we can't do it in our own way. Now, even today, we, we notice people are trying in their own way through works, uh, through spiritual practices. And, uh, you know, there are so many philosophies that exist. But... We very clearly know what the Bible teaches us. You know, no, man, no man comes to the Father except through me, is what Jesus is saying. So that cleansing from our sins, that making us holy, making us righteous to stand in the presence of God, it's only possible if we accept the work of Jesus. And that is what the Holy Spirit is indicating. Okay, And uh, he was just telling of the time when Jesus would come into the picture, all these things would be done, and thereby the practices of uh, uh, the earthly tabernacle will be redundant. Okay, From that point on, we have to grab the new thing, which is our faith in Jesus, instead of going back to the earthly regulations of worship. So pick the kind of worship that Jesus spoke of, you know, uh, the father is looking for worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. So that is the real worship now. Uh, it no longer is the temple worship where we have to go and you know do all these things. So that's the point. I hope uh, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. All right. So moving on, verses 11 and 12. Let's see what is being said here. Uh, 
um yes christ came as high priest of the good things to come and uh, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation so that we have already understood and verse 12 not with the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption so uh, what we are seeing here is that there's a comparison so the high priest was given this ordinance to enter with the blood of bulls and goats why enter with the blood because the blood if you recall even during passover right put the blood on the doorposts put the blood so the blood is indicative of the fact that uh, you know these people belong to you know the god of israel this blood is indicative of the fact that they are protected this blood, uh, you know, is, is indicative of, of many things that are uh, that God is doing uh, for them. So the blood of bulls and goats, you know, was required as the high priest entered into uh, the presence of God. Because one more thing that this blood was saying is, this blood was saying that there is a cleansing okay, available for the high priest as well as his people and that cleansing right through the blood makes them eligible uh, to have this communion with god or uh, uh, receive god's blessings so blood was very very important but here we notice that our high priest the lord jesus if we if we just uh, look at the tabernacle practice of entering into the holiest of holies with the uh, with the blood, Jesus, our high priest, okay, he is entering. He has blood with him, uh, you know, which again indicates that the people belong to him. There is cleansing and all of that, but the blood which he is providing in the presence of God is his own blood. It no longer is the blood of bulls and goats, but scriptures tell us his own blood, he entered the most holy place. So just think about this. He is the high priest. He is the sacrifice. It is his own blood. Okay, uh, and, and this is the way in which Jesus has done his service. And we would say Jesus has done his service, uh, not, not in the earthly tabernacle, but we're talking about the heavenly tabernacle. Okay, So with his own blood, he has entered the most holy place. And it says once for all. Remember, we talked about the daily sacrifices and once a year sacrifices. Uh, but there's no longer a requirement for him to keep doing this daily. The way he has perfected his sacrifice and those who approach God is once for all. Once for all. Okay. And what is it that his blood indicates the blood of Jesus apart from the protection, the cleansing, and all of that that it brings? Here in Hebrews 12, we are told eternal redemption. So the blood of Jesus is indicative of what? Eternal redemption. The fact that we said we belong, right? We belong to God. How, how do we belong to God? How much do we belong to God? <coughs> we belong to God forever. He has purchased us. He has, uh, uh, he has brought us back from the clutches of the enemy. He has delivered us from the bondage of sin. He has positioned us in Christ Jesus. He has blessed us you know, with every spiritual blessing. He has given us inheritance. He has given us, uh, you know, talk about uh, giving us a destiny, giving us authority. 
everything that is part of our redemption and also uh, the fact that this redemption is something that is eternal okay eternal redemption so jesus has done a great work and this is a work which is done in a much superior sanctuary he has entered into heaven with his own blood which speaks of our eternal redemption and no no human can do this for us and no human hands can never ever make this possible for us and as we look at the work that jesus has done for us we also recognize you know we don't know how many of those high priests were were really uh, willing to practice these duties in the temple hopefully all of them were and they were happy about it uh, but what if you know some of them thought uh, this is a lot of work uh, this is too difficult why am i doing this you know but think about jesus the kind of high priest that he is and the kind of sacrifice that he has made for us it's so so much more superior because one thing we know he was obedient to the father right and so his sacrifice it was a voluntary sacrifice it came from his heart when he did all these things for us it was motivated by love so uh, that way that something is motivated by love even though it is hard work it doesn't really feel like hard work and that's the kind of heart that jesus carried towards us he was a uh, voluntary motivated by love and of course you know we know that uh, this is superior uh, because it was also a perfect sacrifice the blood of goats and calves had to be brought in again and again and again but perfection is there in the blood of jesus because once he did this how how often only once and he got us eternal redemption so the blood that was being offered so far was just a shadow of what jesus was supposed to do for us and uh, earlier i have uh, pointed out that the blood which was offered uh, it only covered sins but the blood of jesus the blood of the new covenant it cleanses our sins so let me pause here for a bit if uh, somebody wants to add anything about the blood of jesus you can and the redemptive work of jesus and then we will move forward Uh, well, Pastor, I just just wanted to add to what you said. Um, yes, that the scripture does testify that the life of a thing is in the blood, and um, the blood that Jesus actually offered was a spotless, sinless blood. Um, the reason why His blood, you know, qualified to be the ultimate um, sacrifice, basically to redeem us from sin was because throughout his time on earth even though he was born of a virgin woman he also had to pass the test of overcoming sin in his lifetime so he he, he did not just qualify just because he was the son of god he actually walked upon this earth going through all the various temptations like we've seen in scripture already as we went through and stood against all that and stood with the will of god till death and by that it was it was the only blood you know that could be offered for humanity forever for redemption as a man because jesus christ had to die as a man he didn't die as god he died as a man though he was still god like we've learned so the blood of jesus stands as the ultimate ultimate way for anyone to be cleansed of their sin there's no other amount of blood from animals no amount of blood even you know there's some religions that kill human beings thinking that you know the, they are appeasing god but that will not even qualify so the only blood is jesus the blood of jesus 
that stands for eternity for the cleansing of man's sin. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Say thank, thank you for uh, shedding more light on the blood of Jesus and the fact that, uh, you know, he uh, was born of a virgin. He was fully man uh, because a man had to die for us. And, uh, you know, uh, the quality of, of his blood, which actually helps uh, you know, in, in uh, bringing us this redemption. So a few more things about the blood of Jesus continue uh, in, in uh, the verses uh, 13 onwards. So let's go ahead and, and read that. Uh, I would like to request someone to please read from verse 13 uh, to verse 15. Can I answer? Yes, yes. Yes. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit of offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since the death has a cure that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Yes, uh, thank you, Asha. So uh, just what we've been saying till now, that uh, the earthly offerings um, and the blood of bulls and goats could not cleanse man's sins, but uh, the blood of Jesus could do that for us. So it brought us sanctification, right? That's that's the word which is used there. Sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. And then it says how, uh, oh, well, it says that uh, uh, the blood of goats and bulls and goats, the animals, it sanctified us to a certain extent. But then how much more? How much more the blood of Jesus? So in a comparative way. And it also tells us that the blood of Jesus, which has been offered for us, that it cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So that, again, is a work of the blood of Jesus. So what does that mean? Because the blood has been shed for us, when we find cleansing from the blood of Jesus, our conscience uh, can be made more sensitive to God. Okay, our conscience can be made more sensitive to God. But if we neglect, if we neglect uh, the the work of the blood, then what can happen to our conscience? Our conscience can become hard uh, against what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and what the way in which God is leading us. And uh, so we will not receive the cleansing for our conscience and we have to be very careful because those are uh, that is is something that can lead us into error that is something that can lead us into what we discussed earlier remember the falling away from god so there is a danger if we don't receive the cleansing uh, of the blood and the work of the blood for our conscience then scriptures talk about things like seared conscience defiled conscience evil conscience so these these are things that could happen even to a believer but you know we must be um, cautious about this and receive the cleansing of the blood for our conscience okay uh, now verse 15 here tells us that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. We've already uh, talked about it. And it says, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So Jesus has paid the price, and uh, he has even done it by his own death. All right. So we can move on to the next uh, set of scriptures here. But before that, uh, I'll just uh, go back to some question that I saw Yeah, from Kennedy. He says, until the time of reformation, uh, what does that mean? OK, please give me a moment.
Okay. So uh, when we look at that word, uh, Kennedy, reformation, uh, which is used here, we go back to the Greek. Uh, it simply means a time of rectification, or it also states here messianic restoration. Okay. So uh, as I stated earlier, the simple meaning is the earthly practices were valid till the appearance of Jesus and his work on the cross. So basically, it's it's just that. Okay, so I, I hope that helps. So it doesn't mean any other reformation. It just means Jesus' work on the cross. Okay, all right. Uh, I, I'm just looking if there's any other question. No, there isn't. But Charles, uh, you've raised your hand. Please go ahead. Yes, I have. Yes. Go ahead, please. Um, I, I I wanted to to appreciate the fact that Jesus Christ's blood does the sanctification. Um, as we are looking at the the old covenant and the sacrifice of blood of animals of goats and sheep, for the process of sanctification, it would be very very costly. Um, for us, even today, if we were to do that same thing of bringing goats and sheep and doves and all that, it would be very, very costly. So I want to appreciate the, the, the cost that the Lord Jesus paid for us uh, all those years. I am imagining the time I was born up to today, um, almost making 50 years and I am giving out goats and sheep and all that. It would be very, very costly. So uh, I was looking at that and I was like, wow, you did it for me. You did it for others. You did it for the whole world. The process of sanctification and all that cleansing on a daily basis that you would come be covered by the blood. So I'm really thankful to the Lord for sending his son, Jesus Christ, for our uh, redemption and for mostly the sanctification on a daily basis and on a progressive nature. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much. Uh, you thought of another dimension, uh, you know, regarding the sacrifice of Jesus and the shedding uh, of his blood. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, for us in a natural sense, and uh, even in economic sense, I think it's very expensive, um, you know, to think that so much uh, of blood would need to be shed for all of us. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, I'm just thinking, adding to what you shared, uh, yeah, praise God that uh, it's not costly for us, but it has cost the father everything, you know. Uh, because he sent his only son for us. So I don't know if we will ever be able to understand the cost to the father that Jesus' blood was shed for us. Yes, he did it once, and that has taken care of our costs, but uh, it's it's not, uh, you know, we've heard this said in many sermons that uh, it is salvation is free for us but it's it's not free you know as you look at uh, the sacrifice that god has made uh, and it's it's a very costly sacrifice on his end so just uh, want to add that thought as well yeah uh, anything anything else Yeah, say, did do you want to say something? Oh, okay. I, I, I was also, I was just also going to add, um, when the Bible also, it's still the same book of Hebrews, it compares the blood of Abel and, and the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Abel, you know, is seeking judgment, seeking vengeance. Uh, and then the blood of Jesus speaks better things, as the Hebrew writer puts it, you know, it still goes back again to uh, the quality of his blood. If we remember very clearly, um, all from, from the time of the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was arrested, 
up until the time he was on the cross, you know, there was every temptation to just, you know what, give up, call the angels, curse the people, all those who beat him, all those who um, um, hit him, spat on him. Going back again to what you said about the cost, you can imagine creation you made, you subjected yourself to creation you made that you knew them even before they existed, but you subjected yourself to creation that you made just so that we could be saved. That was the cost he had to go through. And in going through that cost, he did not utter a word of curse. He did not fall out of line. He stayed true. Paradventure, if Jesus had, you know, given up on the cross or did something, hit back at them or something like that, there was no way that his blood would have been able to save us. And so that's why Bible said that as like a sheep, he was led um, to the she- uh, to, uh, it was led to the slaughter. He kept quiet. He was gentle, meek, and stayed true through the process so that his blood remained pure for the salvation of many born at that time and unborn. So it was a huge sacrifice that he paid. And because of that sacrifice he paid, staying true to the will of God, his blood for eternity still cleanses every man of their sins. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, say, uh, yeah, that's the greatness of uh, God's love and uh, his sacrifice for us. Um, Divya also adds here, reminded of the bridge of the song, light of the world, I will never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Okay, yeah, very true, Divya. Uh, So great is God's love for us. Uh, From verses 6 through 22 now. 16 through 22 let's uh, go ahead let's read them and then you know we'll uh, see if we can fit in the remaining verses as well can I read this yes go verse 16 uh for there for where there is a testament there there must also be there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a test- testament is in force after men are dead. Since, since it has no power at all while the testator lives, therefore not even the first covenant was dictated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of cows and goats with water, scarlet wood, and high soap, and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has uh, commanded you. Then then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Amen. Thank you, uh, Kum. So we see the work of purification of the blood and uh, the work of cleansing, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. We saw how Moses has used the blood okay, on all the articles of uh, worship to sanctify them, dedicate them, purify them, cleanse them. And uh, that is something similar you know, that has happened to us. We now have been cleansed and not just cleansed, but we can be dedicated right, unto God. And uh, that will happen through the blood of Jesus. Now, another thing that we saw earlier in verses uh, 16 through 18 is the fact that uh, the covenant is usually made with blood so there was a need for blood okay uh, verse 18 said that not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood so blood was used in making of covenants and uh, in the kind of covenant that god is making with us there was the use of his the blood of his own son he used the he uh, you know ha- he had to shed his own blood uh, and it also talks about a testament. Testament is something like uh, a will of inheritance. And we know that uh, 
legally when somebody uh, is is knows you know that uh, uh, they have uh, descendants they have offspring they want to leave behind you know, what they have for them or e even if they don't they just leave behind a, a legal letter which talks about uh, how everything that they have will now be passed on to uh, their offspring or or anybody that they would like they would uh, uh, like to bless so that is what a testament is in this context so testament he's talking about a testament he says that that uh, promise that god has of his blessings right it uh, we know in the case of a person leaving behind a will uh, for in about inheritance it'll only get activated after the person is gone so while they are alive everything still belongs to them but once they are dead what happens uh, the people whom they have enlisted can now stake claim and take it so he's saying that in the same manner jesus now as a man he died right so he died and thereby what's happening the testament now is applicable the covenant now can take effect so he has done the needful as a man it was required for him to die to activate the testament and even that the lord jesus has done for us and we can be partakers of the blessings of god uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, you know, read. Did we? Oh, yeah, we already read uh, till verse 18. Uh, till where did we read? 22. Oh, okay, 22. All right. Uh, so, verse 18 to 22, uh, we see the dedication of the covenant through the blood. And uh, yeah, we said that um, even Moses did cleansing through the blood so that we've already understood so coming now to the rest of the passage here 23 to 28 but we just have two minutes left so i don't think uh, we'll do justice let's uh, hold it off and uh, we will read it in the next class mm, uh, as far as the progress of our uh, content is concerned uh, my intention is i I think we should be able to complete uh, at least three books in the month of March. It'll be sort of quick, so we won't do um, uh, like very, very uh, deep uh, discussion okay uh, for the other books because Hebrews is a little more uh, technical. it has it has uh, references uh, of the old, testament scriptures and which is why we need to take time to understand them uh, so it, it it takes longer to cover hebrews but once we are through with this the other books uh, we can be a little faster so hopefully three books uh, this month and the rest you know, we we should be able to complete in the uh, next month okay so and assignments also will be up uh, hopefully by next week the first assignment and uh, you can begin working on it so let's uh, close for today uh, could somebody lead us in prayer please let's pray dear heaven father we thank you so much for the time we are spending <clears throat> on your feet listening from you when you are speaking to us through your word Lord, we pray that you will continue to explain to us because you, the Holy Spirit that you sent, is the greatest teacher. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit will teach us more and we will be able to apply these so that we will be able to have a life that pleases you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a great uh, weekend. We will meet up again next week. Thank you.